Hi, I'm Amy Willis. Welcome to Adam Smith Works. And I'm Steve Horwitz. Thanks for joining us today, Steve. It is my pleasure to be here. Are you ready for the Smith <laughs> question? I've been, wait, I've been waiting for this for so long, I can't even tell you. So. Ah, words up. Huh? <laughs> uh -huh. All right, here we go. I have 10 yeah. questions for All you. Right. Would you rather be loved or lovely? Oh, I would rather be lovely, uh, but it is very good to be loved, too. And uh, one hopes one is loved because one is lovely. Which Adam Smith book are you? Oh, well, I would have, I think, if you'd asked me this question a few years back, I would have unhesitatingly answered Wealth of Nations. But it's, I think it's a little more complicated now, but I'm still mostly Wealth of Nations. So I think if, if I have to pick one, I'm still Wealth of Nations. But, uh, but the other one, you know, the other big one, uh, is, is, is become more and more important in how I see the world. Uh, but it's hard, I think, to, at the end of the day to be an economist and not want to still pick Wealth of Nations for all the great things that are in those sentiments. That seems reasonable. All right, serious question. If Adam Smith had a dog, what kind of dog would he have? Oh, what kind of dog would he have? Um, he, he, he'd, have he'd have a hound. He'd have a sort of big, goofy, drooly hound, I think. I, I think because, you know, I think when you're a serious guy like that, you need a big, goofy, drooly hound. Truly. It's a bad, yes. <laughs> So, you know, you know, I'm one of these guys, yeah. right? To to sort of balance it off, and 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 he, he would he would have a very uh, as as my daughter might say, a very basic name. He'd be like like Rover or George or something like that. But he'd be Spot. He'd, Spot, right? Yes. Uh, or or Cat. He he would be a very yes a big Julian Hound. I think he might have been a cat person. He might, he might he might well, you know, he lived at home with his mother. Wow. So hey now. <laughs> All right. Um, if Smith had been a father, what kind of father do you think he would have been? Oh, is that an awesome question? Um, well, I think one of the I think it would have been interesting because this was clearly a man very devoted to his work, right? And and so recognizing that if you're actually going to be a father, it takes time, and that one has to make those trade-offs. Um, I think there is a a paper I would like to write one day. Is is about more moral sentiments, parenting, and family. I think there's so much in there that is interesting about how we think about raising children to be lovely and not love to be, you know, and to be all, all sort of, and how we, you know, help kids sort of think about how other people see them and, rec and developing empathy and all these other kinds of things. So, part of my answer would be if, if, to the degree that intellectuals attempt to parent by thinking about the work, if they're social scientists or managers, or thinking about the work they've done, I think we can look at theory of moral sentiments and get a sense of what kind of father he would have been. He would have been one who was really concerned about raising good kids, good people, right? Kids who became good people. And I think moral sentiments has so much to say about, about how we think about others, about being other-oriented, about not, about, again, I think the, the being lovely, not loved, uh, getting your ego out of the way, all of those sorts of things that are in there are good things that are good parenting things too. That's cool. You know, we have a lot of instances of like Adam Smith's self-help books, right? So an right. Adam Smith's yes. parenting book. Right, exactly. Cool right. Would be, yes. I happen to know a place where maybe, you know, yeah. such a yeah. paper could go. I suspect just you do. Thought, <laughs> um, anyway. It's on the list. Okay. Smith says that one of the times that we experience sympathy is when we appreciate the same work of literature, piece of art, mm -hmm. something like that. So what's something that people should read or watch or listen to to sympathize oh. with you? Oh, well, you know, there's an obvious answer for people who know me, so I'm not going to give that one. <laughs> I, I think, I think, uh, there's a, there's, because I've been talking about it recently, I think people should watch the CEI version of iPencil. And, and I think they should watch it. That, you know, that and, and the Hans Rosling machine, washing machine video, those two videos bring me to tears when I, when I watch them. They're that powerful. Um, and, and if you want to know sort of me and who I am and sort of, how I think about the world. I think they think the the combination of good analysis and humanity and 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 sort of effective rhetoric in both of those things is really really good. I, I won't pick a book though. It'll be an interesting choice because this book had a powerful impact on how I thought about things, and it's beautifully written, and it's and it's it just sort of changed the way I saw the world. And that's Michael Polanyi's personal knowledge, which oh. is a, I, right not one you would have imagined no, thinking I about. Have guessed that. Uh, it's I read it in grad school, 
Uh, and a lot, I think there's a lot to learn about knowledge in there, but there's a lot to learn about sort of how human beings see the world. And I, and I put it down at the time thinking, wow, this is just a really fascinating, beautiful, uh, different book. I mean, I can think of now sort of other books like that. My, I think my, my favorite thing to think when I read a really good book is, I wish I'd written that book, right? <laughs> right. That's how I react to, to really, to really good stuff. And dangerous stuff, right? McCloskey, Deidre McCloskey stuff too is another one, especially the bourgeois virtues, right? Where you read and you go, <clears throat> okay. Yes. All right. right. We'll make sure we put links up to those things. Yes, those please. are great suggestions. All right. If Darth Vader had read TMS, <laughs> how would the Star Wars saga have been different? Oh, uh, well, he would have been a better father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. Wow. Vader had read TMS. How would the Star Wars? Uh, I think. I think that. Yeah. I mean, I think he would have been a better father. He would have seen that attempting to bring his son to the dark side was was not really the message of TMS, right? <laughs> not so much. Not so much. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I think his own uh, devotion to the Emperor also reflects a kind of you know, very non-Smithian, anti-Smithian theme. So, so had, had young, uh, young Anakin Skywalker, been, you know, read it, uh, well, hopefully we'd have a different actor playing Anakin Skywalker. But oh, if, wow. Yes, if, if he had read it, oh, well, the prequels would have been that much, much better, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think there is a, I, I mean, again, if, if you really read and understand TMS, um, I think that it is much more difficult to be to be a bad to be an evil person, uh, and certainly to sort of convince one's children that they should be evil as well. Yeah, I mean, did. he had some pretty cool baubles and trinkets. Well, well right, he did. Kind of like that. Right, but, right, you know. he did. Yes, but but yeah, yeah he did. Uh, and you know that one of my great sort of fantasies. Is, I think that the Emperor is like the juiciest role in the history of film, especially in Return of the Jedi, that last uh, 45 yeah. minutes. I just would, I would kill to, to play that. That's, that's a little thing to know about me. Yeah, all right. Um, well, what do you pursue for pleasure that was once followed for necessity? Wow, for, for me. So Smith talks about yeah, cooking right. and yeah, fishing yeah. and those examples. Um, well, cooking to, to the extent that I do, which is, you know, we have a comparative advantage thing going on in my household, <laughs> but but certainly cooking to the extent that I do, and cooking to the extent we do, maybe that's a better way to put it. When we cook together, in a way that that is, um, you know, we don't have to cook, and it, and it's much, I think, sort of the, you know, it's much more a pleasurable activity than it was in Smith's time, where you're not dealing with an open hearth, and and we have food from all over the world that we can, so all those sorts of things that that turn cooking into into some combination of consumption and production, yeah. literally and economically. Um, so certainly for me, cooking is one of those things that, that would have been a thing, you know, 200 to 300 years ago that, that would have been a necessity but not a pleasure. But I'm not like a, you know, I'm not like a craftsperson or anything. I think the things, uh, the other things I pursue for pleasure are peculiarly modern. Right, like like sort of sports for me is a huge thing, and no, it was that was never a, a necessity. Right, it was always uh, it was always a, a, a joy, a leisure activity, whatever. So so probably cooking, uh, um, well, and and travel, I guess to some degree. Right, I mean, again, if you were wealthy enough, travel was pleasure and, and not a necessity. But but why did most people have to travel if they traveled at all? Was they had to go do something that was required of them or, or a family yeah. member, yeah. right, something not, it was, yeah, it was unpleasant, right, yeah. travel, that's right, travel was unpleasant in a way that now it's, not sometimes it is, but but certainly for many of us much more pleasant, right, and sure. and so I think maybe that too. I don't know, even wealthy travel probably wasn't that great, it took them three right. days to right. go as a well, human, right? That's right, and and I was reading the, the, the John Stuart Mill and Harry Taylor letters, right, which is great, and, but, but you realize when you think about all the travel that was taking place there, uh, and, and I, you know, you bring that sort of this thing up, right? I don't, you know, I, I both with Smith and Hume and with, with, with Mill and Taylor, the time between the receipt of letters versus what we right. have now, it, it's how did you carry on that romance? What, you know, there's this wonderful place where she says, you know, she's rhapsodizing about how she misses the touch of his hand and everything, right? And I'm thinking, wow, you don't even like hear from him for weeks, right? <laughs> 
Much right, less see them. Right, 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 exactly. So, I mean, there's an interesting thing to be thought about how that, what, what relationships were like and how, I, so just one of the, my games I like to play, right, is sort of, it's a great, bit of a gratitude game, but is, is sort of, what if Thomas, we could bring Thomas Jefferson, he's always my example, because he was, for obvious reasons, perhaps. We can bring him alive today, just put, put him in a car and drive him down the street, right? What would he think, right? And sort of, this would be, this, right, would be like, the, all the time he was in France, so and back and forth, right? You know, all the stuff that's in Hamilton, right or wrong, right? What, what, how, what, how much would he appreciate the differences yeah. you know, today, yeah. All right, this might be a related question, but speaking okay. of Hume, I mean, yes. we know Hume was Smith's BFF yes. back in the day, as it were, right? Yes. Who do you think his BFF would be today? Smith's BFF would yeah. be? Yeah. The, the, the person has to be alive today. Mm. Or 20th Ish. century ish. Yeah. Well, so, you know, one of the things, I was, as I was sort of thinking about this and driving over, right, um, I've always wanted to put Smith and Hayek in the same room and see what would happen, right? And so certainly the tempting answer here is Hayek because, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, Hayek owes a lot to Smith, but, but I actually think secretly when you read Hayek a lot, you, you look up at one point and you know, it's all in Hume, <laughs> right? And so, so the role sort of being, you know, taking on the Hume role in that relationship would be interesting. So, so Hayek, is, Hayek is an obvious answer. You know, we can think about other perhaps uh, you know, Deirdre McCloskey would be another one on the list, but she'd be too busy doing this all the time every time she's talking. <laughs> um, but it would be an interesting conversation, right? Yeah. Especially because, you know, he was given Smith living at a time before the big changes that interest McCloskey so much. So I think that would be a very fascinating conversation. But I also think it would be really interesting to have Smith, I'm not sure who the right person is, but to have, it wouldn't be his BFF, but a conversation between Smith and someone from the from the left would be would be also very interesting. But but who would his BFF be in the same way that he was? I think the the, the closest person I think would be Hayek. Um, again, if we have to go with the live people, it's a little bit more challenging. Yeah, that's cool. We'll take yeah. that answer. Okay. All right, just a couple more. Are you ready? Yeah. What's your impartial spectator look like? Well, his name is Steve Horowitz. We know <laughs> we know that we know that part, right? Um, what does he look like? Um, He's, he's, he looks actually, he looks like me, but he's a lot more scowlier. He scowls a lot. He's, he's there right sort here. of, he, just because, because that's the, that's the way of reminding me to not, to not, uh, to not do bad things, right? Um, and he definitely has a Facebook account, that's for sure, because that's the place where I need, where I need him the most, <laughs> frankly. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I always think, it's funny. Uh, I remember seeing other people ask, answer this question. I forgot about it. So. But, but I thought to myself, I, I, don't, I don't visualize my, my person. He, 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 he lives up here, mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the better version of me, right? And so, you know, he, he scowls a lot. Maybe he looks like Jacob Levy. Anyway, he scowls a lot when, 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 because that's his way of reminding me that you're not being the, be the best version of yourself. All right. Last question. Yes. If an afterlife exists, hmm. what would you like to talk with Smith about when you get there? So I think there's an obvious question that everyone who's spent a lot of time with Smith's work would want to ask him and talk about, which is, all right, so the, the, the basic question is, what do you think the relationship between moral sentiments and wealth and nation? <laughs> That's the Adam Smith problem, right? And, and I do think, what would I want to talk about? It would be that. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, you know, if I had to sort of boil it down to something more narrow, but certainly that's the question I would want to talk about. And, and I think one interesting question is, version of the question is, to what degree did you feel like you had to write Wealth of Nations because there was something missing or misunderstood or incomplete about moral sentiments that you felt now had to be said? If we take what has now become, I think, the resolution and understanding of those two books, that, that moral sentiment deals with how human beings uh, uh, interact and coordinate and, 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 and so forth in the world of the intimate, largely intimate, whereas Wealth of Nations asked the same question about the world of the anonymous. I think that's the bait you're going to do. Right. D did Smith recognize that, and did he think that in this world he was living where wealth was beginning, we were beginning to see both the problems he identifies, the mercantilism, 
but also the beginnings of what markets were doing. Did he realize there was something missing from moral sentiments that, from, from that, that as good as it is, that he had to address more thoroughly in, 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 in Wealth of Nations. And, you know, the appearance of invisible hand in multiple places in his work suggests that he had a theme and he was thinking about it and maybe there was, you know. Did, I mean, another way to ask the question is, is, did you plan all along to write Wealth of Nations when you started sure. all sentiments? Or did you sort of later decide, no, I have to write this other thing too? And I think the, that whole set of things is the thing that I would want to talk about. The other thing I'd want to ask him, however, is was your mom a good cook? But you know that's <laughs> that's a whole that's well, a whole different. Thing. She must have Well, right, demonstrated preference. So. Well, right, but but economists always ask as compared to what, right? So we, we don't we don't know yeah. for sure. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today, Steve. My pleasure, Steve. Amy, as always. <laughs>